Hey, Kev, let's let's follow this trail over here. This looks like there might be something waiting down there. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Do you hear that? Yeah, I thought it was just me. What the heck is that? I don't know what that is. Whoa, do you smell that, too? That's unbelievable. Hey, look. What the? Hey, look, those, those branches are moving over there. What the heck is that? Holy cow, is that what I think it is? Look at that thing. Think it, oh my god. It's a freaking Sasquatch. Welcome to the Bigfoot Terror in the Woods Sightings and Encounters podcast. I'm your host, W.J. Sheehan. Hello, everyone, and thank you once again from the bottom of my heart for joining my brother and I for what is going to be yet another spectacular podcast. My name is W.J. Shee, and I am the author of a series of books entitled Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters, all of which are available at Amazon for your reading pleasure. And if you like the audio gig, you can purchase volumes one through six at Audible, Amazon, and iTunes as well. So please go out and buy a couple of hundred books and start passing them around the supermarket while you're shopping. <laughs> <laughs> and now, may I introduce you to my blood brother and co-host... KJ Sheehan. Kev, how are you, bro? I'm good. How about you, Bill? I'm doing pretty good. You know, I was crying the blues to you about all the work I had to do digging out here over the yesterday and today with this. Oh, you've been playing in the snow. Who you kidding? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I was playing in the snow. <laughs> so I'm out there. You, you got about two feet, you think? Yeah, close to it. I mean, I'm out there like I'm in a penal colony in French Guyana. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> a stone bed and a bowl of mush. <laughs> I don't think they have snow in French Guyana, though, right? <laughs> no, but torture is torture. Torture it comes is torture. In, okay, that's it, good. It comes in many forms. <laughs> you know, the water drop dripping on your forehead in a dark box. You know. Yeah, we were supposed to get some good snow on Sunday, which, of course, down here in North Carolina, we, we look forward to it because it's so rare. And all we got was like the worst thing, which is, you know, 32 degrees, 40 mile an hour winds and two days of uh, probably four inches of rain. Yeah, yeah. Just a mess. Yeah, I can handle four inches of rain. Uh, but the uh, the snow, you know, and... You know my property. I got this big-ass driveway and the deck in the back and all of this stuff going on. And um, I got the snow blower, the shovel. And then uh, after I dealt with uh, the lion's share of the snow about midway, it still kept coming down. And I swear I had basically the same amount to do the second time through. Uh, but my fear was that it was going to change to rain and sleet and turn into an ice ball, which is kind of what happened the last time around. I had that slushy mess, you know, where the shovel weighs like, you know, 50 pounds every time oh, you yeah. pick that's, it up. You know? That's way worse. And then when it gets, it melts underneath and then freezes. So you can't uh, even like scrape it along because yeah. you're on that bumpy uh frozen ice. I, I, I used to do the same thing, Bill. I mean, of course, when I lived in New York, but more recently when I lived in Spokane, Washington, where like your big ass driveway, we got big ass snow out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was always out there, you know, a lot of my neighbors wouldn't touch it until it was all done. But I would sometimes be out there two or three times before the end of the storm. You know, Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So uh, listen, bro, as we get going here tonight, uh, as is my custom, I have a little bit of a beef. <laughs> and uh, But we're going to start out with a comment that one of our listeners made to me uh, via email about reading one of the stories in my book, one of my books. Okay. So he said that 
Now, as you know, I'm not a hunter. I'm an East, East Coast guy. He said that he was reading one of the accounts uh, that occurred in Oregon and that uh, he was doubtful of the veracity of it because I used the word grizzly in the description of a bear. Uh, he followed up by saying that there are no grizzlies over there. Now, that could be true or false. I have no idea. But I told him that that was on me, having heard of bear and just assuming it was a grizzly, really not knowing jack about the area. I'm just thinking like all the black bears are over here and all the grizzlies are over there, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, of course, the hunters really uh, have a handle on what's what where it lives, et cetera, et cetera. And I have a tremendous respect because we have a huge following of hunters on the show. Uh, and I've said again and again that I get a tremendous education from these guys every time I talk to them. So I'm not doubting uh, that what he said is true, but really, I don't know. Are there any grizzlies in Oregon? You know, um, I lived in eastern Washington for a while, like I was just talking about, borders with Oregon. And... In eastern Washington, there's definitely black bears and grizzly bears. Okay. And in northern Idaho, there's definitely grizzly bears. And, of course, in western Montana, which borders northern Idaho, there's definitely big-ass grizzly bears. All right. So, <laughs> But so. now eastern Oregon, I don't know. Western Oregon along the coast? No, I don't think so. But there's big bears, Uh huh. you know. Yeah, and I don't know. I'm not saying he's wrong. I respect his opinion. Sure. Uh, and I'm glad to have him listening, as I ha am all hunters. But well, especially I if he lives out there. You know, if he yeah. lives out there and he's a hunter, he knows better than myself or better than you. Yeah, no doubt. But, you know, it got me to thinking. Uh, the, the whole bear thing got my mind going again. And here's my beef. So... It's said that there are about eight bears, uh, varieties of bears, at the present time globally. Eight. The fossil record records potentially 200 bears having been on the planet. Now, I was listening. Now, mind you, when we're just talking about bears, uh, it seems to me as a layman – I don't have a Ph.D. after my name, W.J. Sheehan, Ph.D., which apparently apparently, when you put a Ph.D. after your name, it gives you a license to bullshit about anything as being the truth whenever <laughs> and wherever you want. So this, he, he, this represents the view of my brother. Right, right. So, <laughs> so here we go with W.J.'s beef. So I'm listening to a said Ph.D. the other day. Once again, talking about how Bigfoot is more than likely a gigantopithecus spinoff uh, that walked across the land bridge uh, with apparently, according to Hoy, 75 percent of the other mammals that are currently in the United States or North America uh, and decided to make this area their home. And I started to think about that as I do with many things. You know, I've, I've talked at, at nauseum about the connecting the dots with 50 and 25 billion years between this and that. Like, you know, you have to come up with some incredible number just to ponder and allow your imagination to think that it took 50 million years for uh, this in the solar system to become that. And I don't buy into any of that, believe me. So I'm thinking about all of these mammals and uh, Gigantopithecus. Where is the explanation for animals traveling today? Like, there are no elk herds deciding to migrate across the United States uh, over into New York. There's plenty of countryside, plenty of food, plenty of food products that they could eat. Uh, there's no evidence of certain bears where they are currently residing 
migrating to other areas. There's no throng of grizzlies coming over here or anywhere else in the United States. They seem to have been where they have always been, and they'll never leave there. As far as Bigfoot goes, why is the Yeti where it is? Why is the Yowie where it is? Uh, why is the Sasquatch where it is? You know, uh, are they saying that these now are all uh, varieties of Gigantopithecus, like that came over and then that evolved uh, into eight different varieties of itself. I I don't buy into any of that. It's easier for me to believe that there was a creator and popped these things in where they are and where they were, and it's as simple as that. Why does there have to be this all of this mumbo-jumbo that we are supposed to buy into uh, about how these things happened. Yeah, but, Bill, I mean, I think I think um, there's probably a middle ground, right? I mean, things definitely evolve. And, um, you know, I don't know. Like, for example, Yowie and Gigantopithecus. I remember reading about it when I did the episode on Gigantopith- Gigantopithecus. Um, that... The Australian continent wasn't connected, as I remember, to Asia in the period where that migration could have happened. And it's a long swim to Australia at that time. And by the way, the water's full of uh, monster sharks today, let yeah. alone back then. Yeah. But I, I do think, you know, some of it is the evolution. But if you look at those eight major Uh, species of bears, which, by the way, certainly eight of them, but then there's a lot of other subspecies before people write the letters, you Mm -hmm. know, within each of the eight categories. You know, some of them are similar, but some of them aren't that similar. I mean, you know, I mean, you look at uh, like a koala bear versus a giant panda. Well, I don't know if they came from the same evolutionary track. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, how about a giant panda and a polar bear? Yeah, yeah. And by the way, the and if polar you, by bear... By the way, if you put the pictures next to one another, they don't look at all alike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like the three stooges. They're all stooges, but none of them look like each other. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, listen. So that's my beef. You know, I have no problem uh, in my life... Uh, believing that things are just the way they are because that's the way they were made. You know, uh, a Mercedes-Benz does not become a VW. And I have no problem believing that in nature, you and I didn't climb out of a primordial swamp uh, a million billion years ago and become KJ and WJ Sheehan. I don't think any of that happened. So, and I'm not accepting the rhetoric that says it happened with nature the way they say it happened. So uh, that's my beef, and I'm sticking to it. All right, all right. I mean, it's a different view, Bill. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think I'm more in the middle. Like, I don't necessarily believe, uh, you know, that there wasn't the... uh, the beginning, uh, the spiritual beginning that you talk about. But I do definitely think that there was some evolution along the way with the different species, no doubt about it. But but I'm more, you know, I'm more the the science guy, and that's my role on here. So, but it's all, it's all good. All grist for the mill, as you would say. Yep, yep. And, and see, well, it seems to me like one day I was in the hospital, and... Uh, one of the doctors came over to my console and was inquiring about a patient. So we were talking. It was a quiet time. And uh, somehow I got on the subject of natural cures for cancer. And I started talking to him about some of the things that are said about a variety of different uh, products, all of which come from nature. And he just looked at me and walked away. He wouldn't even engage the subject with me. In the meanwhile, he was the guy who came over to talk to me. So it's weird the way 
some people haven't got involved in, quote, science, have built a wall uh, of, of non-acceptance of anything else other than what was in the books they were taught out of. And that, to me, is a little odd. No? It is, but that's different. Like, I can't, I can't talk for that doctor, but he's got to be an idiot if he doesn't know about the natural cures for things. You know, I mean, the, the largest, last I checked, the largest lobbying group in the U.S. is Big Pharma. Oh, yeah. So, you know, Big Pharma doesn't want you to know about the natural cures or cures that come out of natural ingredients because they're difficult, if not impossible, to patent. But like one of my close friends many years ago, he uh, developed a, a very rare form of kidney cancer. And, um, you know, they basically said they couldn't do anything for him. It was very aggressive. He was going to die, you know, within 12 months. And he was a younger man, middle-aged man at the time, which is younger to me. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Uh, he ended up going over to Europe. I think he was in Scandinavia to get treatment. And they they treated him with, of all things, mistletoe. You know, the plant yeah. mistletoe, which is deadly poison. You know, a lot of people don't think about that. We have a lot of mistletoe growing here in North Carolina. Like, it's a parasitic plant. And you look up in the trees this time of the year in the winter, and you can see the balls. It looks like a ball, the plant of mistletoe up in the trees. And occasionally around Christmas time, I actually climb up in a tree and uh, grab some and bring it down and hang it in the house, you know. But mm -hmm. it turns out, and I didn't know this until my buddy went through this, that the Druids, you know, ancient times, they cured uh, tumor growth with mistletoe. Hmm. And, Amazing. you know, it goes back into ancient times. But, yeah. you know, so he had these deadly tumors in his kidneys, both kidneys, and he went for mistletoe treatment, not from the Druids, thankfully, you know, in a mm -hmm. hospital, but with with medical care that didn't really care about big pharma mm -hmm. and patented drugs. And, uh, you know, that was like 20 years ago, Bill, and he's alive and well today. I talked to him a couple of weeks ago. Excellent. Yeah. And by, and by the way, folks, if you're listening to this podcast for the first time and you're saying, what the heck is with these two jamokes? <laughs> uh, I thought this was a podcast about Bigfoot. Yeah, our podcast is predominantly about Bigfoot. But my brother and I are having a conversation between ourselves uh, like normal people do. And we just happen to be sharing it with a couple of million other people that are listening. So, <laughs> and, and once in a while, well, folks, we reserve the right to go off of the reservation. So, that's correct. Yeah, so we and off. if anybody who knows me, I go off the reservation <laughs> frequently. <laughs> Some may call me the shepherd. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they don't call me the shepherd. No, I'm trying to keep you on the reservation. So let's go. <laughs> To cryptids and other oddities, uh, that segment of the show where I will introduce, and Bill, uh, other than uh, some of this more controversial stuff you're talking about, did you see the news this past week related to the Dyatlov Pass incident in Russia? Uh, you to are you talking uh, television news, written news? Both. Okay, because I didn't see anything about oh, it. Oh, so this is pretty interesting story came out. And this this particular article I'm talking to was on uh, uh, National Geographic Online on January 28th. But it was around different, different places. And uh, it made the news not so much that it was Russia, the Russia's Dyatlov Pass incident, but this scientist, this Ph.D., yeah, you know, that you were talking about earlier, yeah. he was apparently watching the Disney movie Frozen uh, with his little kids, you know, at home in the pandemic. And he was fascinated with the animation, apparently, of the snow and thinking, like, this is truly amazing, being a scientist that studies snow. 
Like, this is so accurate. So it led him, watching this Disney kids movie, it led him into contacting the studio, the Disney studio, and talking to the folks that do the animation, did the animation, of course, computer animation uh, these days. And um, he ended up, like, modifying a, a elegant computer model that he had for studying avalanches, believe mm. it or not. Okay. But now, kind of a little crazy to me, my turn to rant at the PhDs, he came back and, you know, published this paper that he really believed, and the, the, the paper was published in Communications, Earth, and Environment, um, and he believes that an avalanche definitely caused the death of these nine experienced hikers in the mountains of Russia's Ural Mountains, sorry, in the winter of 1959, which became known as the Dyatlov Pass incident. Hmm. Well, you know, there's already been rebuttal uh, against that being true. Well, I mean, the government came out, the, the Russian government came out, I want to say five years ago, uh, and then again, <coughs> excuse me, in 2019, they concluded that it was an avalanche. And the avalanche killed these hikers. But, of course, we all, not we all, a lot of people looked at that and said, all right, this is the Russians. How can we believe anything that they say? Not me, of course. Okay, so, Mr. Putin, if you're listening, I don't question your truthfulness. Mm-hmm. Well, you, <laughs> uh, think Vla- you think Vladimir listens to this podcast? I think he might, Bill. <laughs> I don't want any nerve agent in my mailbox, you know, hypothetically speaking. <laughs> uh, come this get is some wild. Black. So this guy comes out, and uh, now this guy was born in Russia, okay? Um, yeah. And he does talk about the fact that this happened, and uh, he thinks it's uh, an avalanche. So I go back to it. We're not going to revisit the whole Diet Love Pass here, but we did a great episode on it. And um, I don't think it was an avalanche. You know, again, it's it's not on a steep slope, uh, much less than 30-degree slope, which they say for big avalanches, not this gentleman, but for big av- avalanches, they say they usually occur at greater than 30 degree slope. And then, of course, you know, most people die in an avalanche from suffocation, mm-hmm. right? They're, they're alive for a while while they're under the snow. Right. In this case, you have people that, um, you know, had their tongues ripped out, eyes ripped out, and all kinds of very serious internal injuries. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, so... Also, let's go back inside the tent for a minute in our imagination. Mm-hmm. You hear rumbling of this avalanche beginning. Probably sounds like a freight train coming from the distance. Yeah. You know, boom. you don't step out of the tent to stick your head out for a minute and see what the hell's going on, you you immediately grab your hunting knife and start slashing holes through the side of the tent? And you run out of the tent without any clothes on, or yeah. with very little clothes on. I mean, you know, if I'm going down, man, I'm, I'm putting my boots and whatever I can on real quick and then making a run. I'm not going out half naked. Into the snow, avalanche or no avalanche, these these kids were not stupid. Uh, some of them were, uh, I think, doctoral students or, or whatnot in university. No, well, they were highly experienced hikers. So. Yeah, and that we know. So uh, nothing about that makes sense to me. I mean, I'm not there. I'm not at the bottom of a hill during an avalanche. You know, I'm just saying what I believe I would do in the moment. Well, and here, let's be practical about it. you got a couple of feet of snow out in your backyard. Right. You go out there tonight for whatever reason, right? Just go with me for the journey here for a minute. And you put up a tent. And you say you're going to sleep outside tonight. Right. Now, you're not in the Russian Ural Mountains. You're on Long Island. Yeah, there's two feet of snow, but it's not, like, brutally cold. Under what circumstance are you sleeping without most of your clothes on? None. None. 
And then under what circumstance are you taking your clothes off as you cut your way through the tent? I'm not. You're not. And and I know there's these theories, folks, called paradoxical undressing, um, where, you know, like your mind tricks you into doing it. But I'm sorry, you're out there after you hiked days to this spot and camped days to this spot. You're highly experienced. You know, you're in the Ural Mountains. Ain't no way I'm going out with my underwear on. No. no. So I'm you know with what, you. Kev, even if I'm a hunter and I'm going up somewhere to camp out and hunt yeah. uh, in the cold and in the snow, uh, which I don't even know if people do that. I wouldn't do it. But just let's just say you sure, did. Sure, they do. I think they do. All right. So I'm not taking my clothes off under any circumstances, even if I have a little heater in the tent. Yeah. I'm staying dressed and I'll put up with a little stank over a couple of days and I'll take a shower and get cleaned up when I'm done. Hey, stank is good for hunting. Stank. And by the way, so there's still this mystery, too, that a lot of uh, there was radioactive elements present on their clothing. Right. Yeah. So this is where the government, the Russian government, in my opinion, doesn't want you to know what happened, even though I am a subscriber to Occam's razor theory or Occam's theory, where mm-hmm. it says, you know, the most logical explanation is probably the most obvious thing, not the not the fringe cases. So the obvious thing would be an avalanche. So, folks, don't write letters saying telling me about Occam's razor. I get it. Uh, but in this case, like there's a lot of other stuff going on here that says it wasn't an avalanche. Right. So. Now, what is uh, Occam's razor? Is Occam an individual? Yes. And, At- I mean, the theory there is that the the most obvious solution to the problem is the solution to the problem. So, you know, it holds true sometimes, but it doesn't hold true all the time. Like, for example, you know, Occam's razor, if you applied it to all of the Bigfoot and Sasquatch sightings, would say it's a bear. You know, and we joke about that, right? Like... It's it's not a bear, right? Um, but but that would suggest it's a bear. You know, in in the so old, uh, in other words, don't make it more complex than it is. It's probably the simplest idea, not the most complex. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm a big Sherlock Holmes fan, uh, and uh, kudos to the author. But you know, in the Sherlock Holmes uh, series, Holmes was. Uh, famous for making the statement that after you've alleviated everything that is untrue, whatever you are left with, no matter what it may be, must be the truth. Yeah. And I I thought that was wise beyond wise, uh, that statement. And I wonder if we could apply that same wisdom to the Dyatlov incident. Of course, you and I weren't there, but what things could not be true about what happened there? No, no doubt about it. You know, it's a a weird thing. Yeah, I mean, some of the things are a missile test. And remember that they they found, I forget what it was, they found a boot, a cover from a Russian army militia boot. Right. uh, Was found in the accident site. You know, right. way before uh, the the accident was reported, like that, right. that these troops were there and didn't say anything about it. So there's this theory that it was a UFO, uh, a true alien thing, you know, a meteor mm-hmm. or, you know, a missile test because it's a pretty rural place there. And maybe they were firing a missile and testing it out. Like, personally, I think could be the, the missile test. And then, you know, you think of the, uh, there was that image, right? The coolest thing about the whole Dyatlov Pass, uh, you know, horrible thing, right? It's a horrible thing. All these people lost their lives in an instant. But Mm -hmm. the coolest thing is you can go, anyone can go up to the web and download all of the photographs that they took over this multi-day period and look at them in sequence. And then they have that one photograph, I forget which frame it is, 
but it looks just like a Bigfoot standing there in the snow in the woods. Yeah, there's no doubt about that, yeah. in my opinion. And then as we spoke about in the episode we did on Dyatlov, my opinion was how did these astute young people rattle off so many valuable photographs at trees? Yeah. You remember all of those shots that were just like at fir or spruce trees? Like, what were they looking at? Well, that's, I, my, it. that's the theory. They were trying to get pictures of this creature that was maybe following them, right? you know, and shadowing them. And then what? And then he does show up. This creature does seem to show up in one of the photographs. Right. And, of course, we can't interview them. No. But probably if we could, they must have seen something dark moving in the boughs and took a shot. Right. And then never having had a chance to develop it or look at it, there may have been something in those boughs or trees moving around, and they were trying to get it for the record before they actually got a shot of it passing through that little corridor between the trees. Now, that's a great point, because we think of that today, and we're like, how could they, you know, why would we see these pictures with nothing in it? But if any of you ever took film pictures, which I'm sure a lot of our listeners did, you didn't know if you got the shot until like a month later when you got your prints back. Right. Yeah, that's a right. really good point, Bill. And this is yeah. 1959. That's Nobody's right. got their uh, iPhones or uh, di digital SLRs with them. Yeah, and who knows what the development of film was like over there for them. What did it cost? Uh, how viable could you get it done quickly? Come on, and, and this is Russia, Bill, at the height of communism. Everything was great <laughs> and everything was free. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm just saying. I'm not buying it. I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, that's incredible. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. So uh, back to Dyatlov. And by the way, don't forget the native folks here, which were on that television show that we talked about back when, where they interviewed them, that, that knew when this happened. I forget what they were called, the Manzi. The Mank. Mank. The Mank, yeah, and uh, no, they, wait a second, no, the Mank, the Mank is one of the Russian names for the Bigfoot. Yeah, it's like Man but they were the, they were the Manzies. Yeah, and they talked about the fact that they called this area like the Valley of the Dead or the Mountain of the Dead, right? <laughs> Which is generally not a good sign, you know. Well, others say that it wasn't called the Valley of the Dead because of some horror story. Uh, there were those who say it was called the uh, the Mountain of the Dead because there wasn't anything really going on there. Oh, I thought you like were going to say that they wanted to keep tourists out because it was so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, in other words, maybe these uh, Manzies or whatever their name were, uh, there wasn't great hunting over there. Yeah, sure. Or, or whatnot. That could be. That you know, it was like a, a be. quote, dead zone, you know? Sure, certainly. Or it could be called the dead zone because the Bigfoot had torn apart everything that could be torn apart. And in whatever that they went in there, they lost a couple of people to the Bigfoot. I mean, maybe. <laughs> to the mank. All right, Bill. So let's leave Rushka and let's talk about the account that you have this week. What do you, what do you have for us? Well, I got something pretty cool. And every account of Bigfoot is cool, and that's why I tell people, if you've seen something, say something. Uh, contact us at BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com. Hit the link. Uh, tell me your story, your name, your address, your bank account number. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And uh, I'll get back to you, and we'll have a conversation about it. It's one of my favorite things to do. Now, according to Brian Lynch... His Bigfoot sighting on the Dream Lake Trail wasn't a dream at all. Listen to me, or let's listen together, as I read what Brian Lynch had to say. It was in July of 2015 when a couple of my besties and I were on a hike in the Rocky Mountain National Park on our way to Dream Lake. We were about four hours into the trek and were following a meandering trail at some elevation. 
working our way around an enormous boulder. From our vantage point, Long's Peak was visible way in the distance. To our left and falling away from the trail was a slope covered in some grass, brush, and small pointed pines of many shapes and sizes. As we had just made it around this large boulder, there were several other smaller and flatter rocks that seemed to be inviting us to take a break, and so we did. Hold on for a second. As we had, oh, excuse me, buh, 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 buh. the trail here almost gave the appearance of tan beach sand in contrast to the surrounding color palette. Just ahead of us, at a distance of about 200 feet, this tan trail wound around a bend and vanished from view. The three of us had chosen different spots to cop a squat on two different boulders. My back was to the very view that I just described to you because of where and how I chose to sit, as was my friend Kevin's. Bobby, however, chose to sit on a smaller boulder that was about 10 feet down the slope and was facing towards the direction of our heading. I was munching on a couple of packages of Belvita crackers and drinking some Gatorade when Bobby said, Hey guys, there's someone coming. It was about two seconds after what he had just said registered in my brain that he then said, What the heck is that? Startled, Kevin and I quickly spun around. The three of us were now sitting with our collective eyes fixed on a large brown figure that had stopped dead in the middle of the trail ahead of us, having just come around the bend. I guess momentarily it hadn't registered in Bobby's mind that he was looking at a Bigfoot, because we now were all too well aware of what it was we were seeing. The creature appeared to be equally as shocked as we were from the way it had suddenly stopped and stood there. It was staring right at us and began to rock from side to side. At this point, we had all gotten to our feet and were looking right at it. I think the distance was only about 125 feet or so, if my memory serves me correctly, as we just faced each other off. What I'm about to say may seem really off the wall, but I'm going to say it anyway, because nobody who reads your book, Bill, will ever meet me to beat me up about it. In that moment, a deep sense of despair and loneliness started to overwhelm me. It hit me like a spiritual wave, and this feeling I was having wasn't for us, but rather for the creature. I felt as though it was emotionally distraught and wanted to communicate to us, but couldn't. There was absolutely nothing aggressive whatsoever about its posture or its actions. To me, it was just exuding sadness. What I did next, only a pet lover will understand. But I gently raised my hand and said, Hello there, we are your friends. I tell you the truth and no lie. In the moment, I didn't have an ounce of fear in me about this creature. I only felt sorrow as though it badly needed our help. No sooner had I said this than it raised its arms gently and kind of nodded its head, retreating back to where it had come from. As soon as it had moved out of sight, my friend Kevin, not knowing how or what I was feeling, said, That was awful. I asked him, What do you mean? 
he said to me that I felt like I was at a funeral or something. It was like there was a heaviness all over me while that Bigfoot was standing there. I told him, I can't believe that you just said that because all I could feel was sadness about the thing and you just confirmed it with your own lips. He said to me, yeah, man, it was like it just wanted to talk to somebody and was even more upset that it couldn't. We all slowly walked up to where it had just been and could actually still see it walking back down the trail. As we stood watching, it turned its body one time to look back at us and disappeared. When I say disappeared, I'm not talking about around a blind corner. I am talking about it vanished. Like now you see me and now you don't if you catch my drift. The three of us just stood there looking at each other and the trail as if to say, did we just see that? And yes, we just had. I looked down at my feet, and I could clearly see the prints of what would have been large human-like feet in this sandy surface of the trail. This being that actually had substance to it, having left tracks, had just vanished before our eyes. I have no explanation for what I have just conveyed to you, nor will I even attempt to rationalize the event in any way, shape, or form. You can simply accept it or reject it entirely, and I will understand. As the creature stood in the trail at fairly close distance to us, it seemed to be almost seven feet tall and at its shoulders twice as broad as the trail, being some four feet or so. It had simply come to a halt upon seeing us and was gently rocking back and forth from the waist up. The hair was somewhat long and brown, and I could see the skin of its chest through its fur. The skin on its face looked like a weather-beaten dark gray color. The hands were the same. How it is that something that has form and shape and function can just disappear is beyond me. I really don't expect anyone to frankly believe me, yet I have told the story again and again, and now, Bill, I have told it to you. What do you think of that, Kev? Whoa. You know, well, I think it... I'm not that mystified with it disappearing, you know. So you're talking about um, Rocky Mountain National Park. It looks like that lake is, you know, west uh, into the mountains there. You know, the peaks around there are more than 11,000 feet high. Some of them are more than 13,000 feet high. So it's really rural, a lot of lakes, good place for a Sasquatch. Um, and it could just be camouflage. You know, these forests are dense out there. You're like in shock seeing this thing, and then it walks away and appears to have disappeared. But I, you know, could just could just be the stealth camouflage that these creatures appear to have to me. To yeah. Me. Now, so he is he is an alternative viewpoint. As you know, I've never seen a Sasquatch, but I've heard about a lot of people who say they've seen a Sasquatch. And I continue to interview people on a weekly basis that say they've had interactions with a Sasquatch or found evidence of there being a Sasquatch. Many, many people have said it was walking in front of my truck and it was gone. It was coming towards me and disappeared. I have an account in Volume 9, which will be out somewhat time in the future, where the couple said they saw this thing descend on a mountainside as though it was going down a flight of stairs into the mountain. And a month later, they went back to the area where they had seen from afar this activity going on, 
There was nothing there. There was nothing to hide behind that would make it look like it was going downstairs. There was no old mine shaft. There was nothing. And yet, according to them, this thing was climbing up a steep slope and then appeared to disappear from the feet down after the head was the last thing to go, and it was gone. Now, that's just freaking weirdness, man. Yeah, but, I mean, then you are saying this is a non-flesh-and-blood Bigfoot, right? I don't know. I don't know what to say about this. It's almost like some of these creatures uh, are uh, interdimensional or something. They could be here and then not. They could be physical, then not physical. Yeah. They could show up in our world and then poof, they're gone. Yeah. So here's an example of Occam's razor we were talking about earlier. You know, I'm I'm leaning towards camouflage. You know, the thing is, we know they're super stealthy. We know they can. Be there and not see them, right? You know, whether they're laying down, standing behind a tree, stand, crouch down, whatever, up in a tree, who knows? But I, I tend to lean towards camouflage in that case. Like, that's that's what I was thinking as I was listening to the account. But it could be, you know, it could be something else. Then what do you say about the finding of footprints, following a trail of footprints, and then they stop and there are no more. Well, I mean, without knowing the circumstance, I mean, it could be anything, right? The ground could have got hard or, you know, whatever. Um, but, you know, we do certainly have those accounts, Bill, of what I would call the non-flesh and blood Bigfoot, yeah. where they're floating across the surface of the snow. You yeah, know, and you there's know, no footprint. That's it. And you know what really grabbed me about this? This is the only account I have where more than one, if it was one, it would be enough for me. But more than one in the same group of three had these feelings of remorse and sadness come over them. Yeah, I wanted to while, come back to that. I mean, so do you think it misplaced its Yeti cooler full of Pabst Blue Ribbon? <laughs> I mean, that would get me upset if I was out yeah. there. And, and it was ticked off because it couldn't ask them if they saw I the peel. Have you seen the cooler full of Pabst Blue Ribbon? I'll give you a couple <laughs> if you help me find it. But it's standing there saying, I can't even communicate with these people. Where the heck is my PBR? <laughs> yeah, and it's Super Bowl Sunday. Exactly. Come on. You know how hard it is to get a Yeti cooler full of uh, PBR up here? You know, before the Super Bowl, and let alone a Bigfoot buying a Yeti cooler. Like, this, that's a little paradox there. <laughs> well, I don't think he would buy it. He would probably just go in the store. Everybody would start running for cover. He'd grab the cooler and walk back out and maybe leave a pine cone on the counter. As yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe step out on the interstate there in the Rockies and just tear one <laughs> off the front of a pickup that <laughs> slowed down. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy, man. Uh, <laughs> one of the more bizarre uh, accounts uh, that I have ever heard, you know. And, yeah, that, uh, you know, but on the serious side, though, that is, to me, Bigfoot country out there. You know, well, those Rocky Mountains in western uh, Colorado, it is yeah, uh, beautiful. Yeah, you know, and here's another guy that uh, his ancestors walked across the land bridge and uh, they built a cabin in the Rockies. <laughs> uh, they've been homesteading there ever since. Did a little snowboarding. <laughs> oh my goodness well that's it Kip so what do we got from our fantastic listeners today oh we got some good listener mail this week uh, so first off we're going to go to John and John didn't say where he was from but he uh, his subject is spreading your podcast and he said just gave you guys five stars I've been sending my friends and relatives links to your shows. I haven't heard anything from them. I haven't heard from any of them since. <laughs> he says, seriously, you guys are. He, he says, seriously, you guys are great, and the people I have sent the links are now listeners also. When are you going to offer some mugs and T-shirts and other merch? 
So first off, <laughs> thank you, John, for uh, giving us five stars. You know, that's fantastic. And we are working on it. I know I've talked about working on merchandise, but as I'm sure a lot of you can appreciate, uh, Bill and I have this other full-time gigs in our lives. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's slowing us down. But we would love to offer it, and we will offer it. We're just, it's on the list of things to do, and we never get to it, you know. That's right. But we will and, get you know, to it. You know, guys, like yesterday and today, I spent about six hours cleaning up snow, uh, and I also was working on Volume 9, and here my brother and I are doing a podcast tonight. So it's not like we're not doing anything, you know. Uh, we're mindful of what's going on and we have plans to do this and that. But in the meantime, we're just pretty much doing what we have to do. And uh, when opportunity strikes, that will happen as well. No doubt about it. Well said. Yep. And by Our- the way, Kev. Yeah. Let me just say something here. If you are a listener to our podcast, of which there are many, and uh, you have a great company or service that you think uh, uh, others may want to know about, my brother and I are looking for a couple of advertisers in the ranks. So if you have a product or a service and you'd like to associate it with our brand, we'd like to hear from you. And you can contact us at BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com on our contact link. And Kevin would be happy to get back to you uh, and see what it is you have to offer. Yeah, it's an interesting just, challenge. Do, do you associate your brand with my brother and I? <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you work at Smith & Wesson. <laughs> yeah, Perfect. <laughs> maybe maybe you're the president of a rifle manufacturing company. <laughs> and you'd like me to recommend the carrying of your firearms into the woods. Maybe I'd you be make happy to do point so. ammo, you know. That's right. <laughs> maybe you make crossbows with deadly tips on them. Oh. Think about that. For the zombie apocalypse. Yeah, maybe you're fishing for salmon. When a Bigfoot sneaks up on you and you have to use your fly rod to fend him off. (laughs) Think about it, folks. All right. We got a good one here from Kelly in Michigan. And she says, wow, I was certainly surprised when I found this podcast. Monroe, Michigan isn't a place you hear about often. And she's writing about episode 72, the Monroe, Michigan Bigfoot encounter. Yeah. She says, I really enjoyed listening. I was born and raised there and remember around 1973 to 1974, my brother and his friends went camping not too far from home. They showed up in the middle of the night, all out of breath and scared half to death. They had seen a Bigfoot. Mm. He came into their campsite. They talked about the smell, long, stringy hair, and how big the creature was. I believe my dad even had to go out the next day to get their tents because they wouldn't go back. Yeah. Anyhow, just wanted to say how much I enjoy listening. Keep the stories coming, Kelly. Yeah. Now, I contacted Kelly, uh, Kev. I haven't heard back from her yet. Okay. Uh, but uh, I'm hopeful to have a one on one with her to get. Always in the one-on-one, I get more details. You know, I kind of dig away at the, the the story, and I find a little bit more out, you know. Yeah, no doubt about it. And But pretty interesting, though, huh? I mean, just another, quote, simple encounter. Yeah. Uh, that the only reason we know about it is because we're doing this podcast. Exactly. Exactly. You know, so it's, inter- it's interesting how many people come out of the woodwork uh, when they feel it's safe to do so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. All right. The next email comes in from Robert. And Robert doesn't say where he's based, but his uh, letter is about uh, Champ or Champy, the Lake Champlain monster. So maybe uh, maybe he's up in that neck of the woods in Vermont or upstate New York. And Robert writes, uh, hello, Bill and Kevin. I hope that all is well with you and yours. I love your show. 
I listen to current and past episodes at night before I fall asleep. You guys crack me up. He said, in regards to the fish populations in Lake Champlain, there have been no less than 92 species of fish and eels identified in Lake Champlain. Smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, pike, muskie, walleye, salmon, lake trout, not to mention the prey species like chubs, minnows, and even blueback herring, which spawn in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. In addition, there are abundant waterfowl populations and dozens of mammals that call the lake their home, like beavers, muskrats, minks, etc. Therefore, I believe that there's plenty of food population to support Champ and his buddies. Just a tidbit of information for you guys. Keep the episodes coming, and God bless you and yours. Respectfully, Robert. Wow. So good stuff, yeah. Robert. Good facts. I mean, really, uh, you know, I was talking about, I was contrasting uh, Champy with uh, the Lake Ileana monster up in Alaska, where they have, you know, millions of salmon every year that these creatures could be chomping on. But Robert makes a good argument that it's not only about what's in the lake, it's about the mammals, too, around the lake and the waterfowl, which yeah, is a great There's no point. doubt. Yeah, you could Shopping snap some a of duck. those Canadian geese, Bill. Sure. No problem. I mean, they're floating on the surface. Whack! And I mean, you've got Thanksgiving species, dinner. But not protected from Champy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, try <laughs> to tell Champ they're protected. He'll chomp yeah. you. You can't be eating those geese, Champy. <laughs> Imagine if you were standing on a corner and you said, Hey, chomp you, man. <laughs> Chomp, chomp, All right, chomp. and our last letter, Bill, I'm sure you saw this one from Steve, which uh, Steve didn't say where he's from, but I love it, uh, how he... I think he's. How, a, I think Steve's a shapeshifter. <laughs> but he writes, Dear <laughs> WJ and Kevin, and remember, when you're out on Lake Champlain, all alone doing some night fishing, and you hear something in the water that sounds monstrous, Always bring more harpoon than you think you're going to need. <laughs> he writes, night, <laughs> night, kitties, Steve. <laughs> I love it, Steve. I was laughing out loud when I read that. Yeah, always carry more harpoon than you think you're going to need. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. All right, folks. Well, great reviews lately. Keep them coming. Those five-star reviews are really the only way we attract new listeners to the podcast. So it's really important. Just leave us one right now, five-star reviews. And some of you have been leaving those great written reviews, too, which really just keep Bill and I going. You know, we read them, and it's so great to hear all of the supporting and kind words. So be safe out there. You know, COVID's got some new variants. Uh, we're in the heart of winter, but things are going to get better soon. Yeah, folks, great podcast, great listener mail, and on and on we go. And according to the account that I shared with you today, these three fellows were not following WJ's advice. And you know what that advice is. Always carry more gun than you think you're going to need. Sleep tight.